Once again, uh, my name is Trisha Shimamura. I'm the Director of Community Affairs for the Manhattan Borough President's Office. Welcome. Happy uh, Wednesday. Uh, we are, I hope that you found uh, your, yourself here today because you've seen um, our ads or received an email from me or seen something promoted on, on social media around uh, this leadership training series. A part of uh, our charter mandated responsibilities in the president's office is to provide uh, technical uh, support and, and trainings to community board members. We take this very seriously and wanted to not only cre create an opportunity to uh, engage with community board members, but also to the broader uh, world of Manhattan, anybody who's interested in, in learning more about civic engagement, anybody who wants to brush up on their uh, on very important skills that can help them better serve their communities. So that's how we started to create um, this kind of series of webinars. They're, they're designed to be very uh, brief so that you can really take that. We don't wanna add more to your plate. We really want the, it to be strong food for thought, things that you can take away, walking away with a better sense of resources that you can engage with further, some um, kind of uh, key points that you can ap uh, apply to your work in the community, be it on a CEC or community board or attendance association, block association, nonprofit group, what have you. Um, I wanna give a huge shout out to Porfirio Figueroa, Eric Cuello, Don Billings from my team, the rest of uh, community affairs. You know them because if you've ever gone to a community board meeting, there is a representative from our office there. Um, they put a lot of thought into putting together this program and are handing all, handling all of the back end uh, technical work on this. So many, many thanks to, to my team. I also wanna thank uh, Ryan, um, from CCHR, who we'll hear from a little bit for being our featured speaker today. We designed this specific, uh, well, I should say before beforehand, before I go into the specifics here, um, that we have a, a number of additional trainings happening this week. I do want to make a special plug for Friday's training, which is not going to be virtual. It will be in person. It will be at John Jay College. And I really hope that you um, not only join us for a few more virtual trainings over the week, but that you come in person on Friday at 12 o'clock at John Jay College. We're gonna be doing an emergency preparedness training with New York State Office of Emergency Management and John Jay College. It's gonna be great if you register beforehand, you'll get to not only get a lot of good information, but you'll also walk away with a fully stocked go bag. Uh, with a first aid kit, flashlight, and a bunch of other uh, supplies that, that are really just useful to have around. I will tell you from personal experience, uh, the last time I took this training was about seven years ago. I used my go bag uh, at least twice in two very bad run-ins with a, a pumping carving knife and another emergency situation. So we're very, I'm very grateful to have the training on myself. I hope that you will join us. It's going to be a great time and really, uh, really, really helpful. Um, so with that though, today we're talking about uh, de-escalation, bystander intervention, all things ar around uh, broadly the topic of conflict and what do you do in conflict. And if you've served on a community board meeting or if you've done anything in community engagement that you know that Manhattan has uh, no shortage of passionate people who care very strongly about uh, taking care of their neighborhoods, and sometimes those things conflict. Um, conflict is a natural part of doing this work, and so we really appreciate uh, Ryan and CCHR for being here to talk a little bit about what happens when when things um, don't feel right, when there's uh, an escalated situation. How what do we do in those situations? What are some good tools to um, to think about when, if you are ever caught in those situations? I hope that um, you don't. I hope that things are always uh, respectful and courteous, but you know, un unfortunately, uh, having served on my own community board for a number of years, I know that that's just not always not the case. And so when things go get heightened, what do we do? 
I also just want to say, because we just came off of last night having an EEO training, we had a conflicts of interest training uh, earlier this week with a parliamentary procedure training. All of these things also come into play here. And so I just also want to say that if um, that truly in our office, we believe that everybody has uh, the right uh, to feel safe and to feel respected, uh, particularly when we're conducting meetings of any kind. Um, you know, when when things get out of hand, it just detracts away from the work and it really um, is not something that we support or endorse. And so if you ever do have a question about an interaction that you had, about some sort of situation that that's happening in the community, you should always feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to try to connect you with the right resources. Um, we, we really are here to try to support community boards and other organizations to make sure that they can do their jobs to the best of their abilities to. So with that being said, I'm going to ask for Eric Cuello, our deputy director, and Porfirio Figueroa to put their contact information into the chat so that at a minimum you have our contact information. Um, and then we'll, you know, of course, welcome CCHR. I'm sure they're going to have additional resources that uh, you can also use um, in in your daily interactions with community as as you as you work with community every single day. Uh, just a couple housekeeping pieces. You already heard my plug for Friday's event. You already heard that I hope that you continue on with more of these webinars that are going to be offered throughout the rest of this week. I will just say if you have a question in the next hour or so, I ask you put it in the Q&A function at the uh, at the bottom of your screen. You can see there's a little Q&A box right there. Click on that, put the question in there. That's the fastest and easiest, most effective way for us to answer them. We are really trying to keep these to an hour because we respect your time. We understand that no community board member needs additional meetings on their calendars. And we really appreciate that you're taking the time to be here. And I also wanna give a shout out to a couple of you, Doug Kleiman being one of them. My goodness, um, I've seen you at a number of these events and I really appreciate um, so many of the board members who have uh, kind of participated multiple times. It makes me really happy to see um, you enjoying this series and, and getting something from it, I hope. Additional um, pieces. Uh, it could be very possible that for whatever reason, you can't stay with us the entire time. That's okay. We know you have sick kids at home, probably like myself. You have work obligations. Things come up. Um, don't fret, although we want you to stay here for the entire time. If you notice on the top left-hand corner of your screen, it probably says the word recording on there, and that's because we're recording this entire session. All of the sessions are recorded. All of them will be posted on our <laughs> excuse me, <clears throat> uh, YouTube page at the end of this week. So we hope that you stay. We hope that you engage and ask questions. But if for whatever reason you have to leave early, we understand uh, we're going to post them on, on our website after this, after this series. There was one question here that was asked about um, what, that was asked about uh, which ones are mandatory for community board members. This is a good time just to say, if, I mean, not all of the, I assume that not everybody on this training is a community board member, but if you are appointed to one of our 12 community boards, when we appointed you, we sent you a letter saying, by the way, we expect you to complete three trainings every year that we will offer, offer multiple times a year. Um, that's because we take them so seriously. Those trainings are conflicts of interest training, which was earlier this week, an EEO training, which stands for Equal Employment Opportunity, and then finally, a Combating Implicit Bias training, which is not this one, um, although similar topics. Um, uh, and that training, I, I believe, is going to be scheduled for the first week of December, so just keep an email out for that, an eye out for that. Again, we understand people are busy. This is not the only time that you're going to have these trainings. We have um, many, we want to create as many, much opportunities as possible. This is not a, you know, gotcha sort of situation where we want to get, make sure that you somehow, you know, um, missed a training and therefore are ineligible to serve. This is really just um, emphasizing that we take these, these topics very important. The fact that we've asked CCHR to be here today and not hold, hold these other trainings, we, we know how important they are to the work. Uh, and so that's why we've uh, that's why we'll create multiple opportunities for for everybody to access them. With that, I've spoken enough uh, clearly. Uh, so I'm going to pass it over to Porfirio to do a very brief introduction to Ryan before you guys get into the topic. Eric, <laughs> our deputy, is going to uh, end the session today right around one o'clock. Um, and if you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Thank you for being here. I hope I will see you on Friday. The event is open to everybody. 
So anybody can join, your grandma can join, your neighbor can join, your fellow community boards members can join, community board staff can join. All we ask is that you must register beforehand because the state is the ones that are, prov are providing these awesome go bags and they need to know how many to bring. So please, uh, I think the information's in the chat, register, we'll see you on Friday. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Porfirio and Eric. And um, I hope this is a great session. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Tricia. So uh, New York City is unique because we value the importance of protected classes of status, identity, orientation under the New York City human rights law. That's just to name a few. So we are so excited and lucky to have Ryan Dubois, who is an associate human rights specialist at the New York City Commission on Human Rights. He's here today to speak about the unique ways that New York City respects and protects those rights. He has 16 years plus experience uh, in community organizing and human rights advocacy, um, both domestic and international. Ryan serves as the commission's liaison to Native America and indigenous communities and is a fluent Spanish speaker. He also works heavily with New York City's Latinx immigrant communities. Ryan, we are thrilled to have you, and I will turn it over to you. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Trisha and Porfirio. Uh, it's definitely a pleasure to be here with everybody today. Um, definitely looking forward to giving this training. I think a lot of the commission's trainings are more so oriented towards legal education. Um, the nice thing about this training is it's it's uh, it provides a lot more kind of hands-on, uh, practical um, materials that you'll hopefully be able to apply in your everyday life. So. Uh, yeah, it's definitely a presentation that's probably our most high demand uh, training that we have that I that still take quite frequently myself and my colleagues. So um, definitely looking forward to a great training today. Thank you all for being here. And with that said, I'll go ahead and share my PowerPoint and we'll get started. <laughs> All right, can folks confirm that they can see the PowerPoint? Yes, we can. Yes. Excellent. Great. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So as you can see from our title, the focus on today's presentation is moving from being a bystander to an upstander uh, with the obvious difference that a bystander may be um, witnessing an incident, whereas an upstander is going to actively stand up and uh, intervene in a situation that they um, would want to interrupt if they were to witness a hate crime or a bias incident. Uh, so just a quick note on this training, uh, although we are the Commission on Human Rights facilitating today, this training was created in collaboration with the Center for Anti-Violence Education. They've been doing work for the past 45 years in the community to disrupt uh, bias incidents and hate crimes uh, and, and types of violence like that. And so um, just a few ground rules before we get started. Uh, we like to be on the same page about um, just being on the same page about uh, respecting each other as we're speaking, there being one mic, respecting gender pronouns, um, being open to different perspectives, uh, speaking from an I statement rather than speaking on other people's behalf, and also just paying attention to the degree to which um, we're you know participating in the discussion versus... Um, allowing space for others to participate as well. All right, so the agenda looks like it's quite a bit, but in fact, uh, really, we're just breaking down into um, two kind of thematic halves here. So in the first half, we have uh, just a little bit of background on the City Commu Commission on Human Rights, who we are, what we do, and uh, it's a little bit of social context about how we will uh, talk about and approach the issue of um, uh, bias incidents and hate crimes that occur in the community. And then in the latter part of the training, we'll talk about specific tools for actually uh, intervening in a situation that we would like to interrupt. Um, and I just wanted to do a quick check as well with regard to audience participation. Um, Porfirio and Trisha, folks, can, are, are folks able to unmute themselves and speak or should they just be putting comments in the chat? How should we do uh, audience participation? Yeah, all questions will go into the Q&A and we will do them at the end. There is also, if you need it, a raise hand function in case you have any questions. Perfect. Okay, excellent. Um, so yeah, just just as a heads up to folks, um, so we also, as part of the latter part of the scenario, we will be doing um 
uh, as the latter part of the training, we'll be doing a series of scenarios. So I'll be reading a few scenarios um, that are kind of like real life scenarios that may occur um, that are based on, you know, incidents that really have occurred in New York City. So that would be a, also definitely an opportunity to fo for folks to, um, you know, share their thoughts about how they would react to those situations as well. All right, so a little bit background about the commission as well as CIE. So the Commission on Human Rights is the city's civil rights law enforcement agency. Uh, we have our law enforcement bureau, which is where our attorneys operate. I'm with the community relations bureau, which does trainings and education in the community such as this. And as I mentioned, uh, CAE, who we de developed this with in collaboration, uh, their mission is to prevent, intervene, and heal from hate violence in our communities. All right, so the commission has uh, four primary departments. I've mentioned two of them, the Law Enforcement Bureau, as well as Community Relations. We also have the Office of Mediation and Conflict Resolution. Uh, those are for when two parties are interested in facilitating a resolution uh, to an allegation of discrimination rather than litigating in court. Mediation Department will handle that. We also have the Office of the Chair, uh, which focuses on expanding uh, the protections that exist under the law. Although New York City does have one of the most expansive civil rights codes in the country, we also know that there have been historic loopholes in that law. So we always seek to expand the law to make sure that no one is excluded and falls through the cracks. <clears throat> and we have a few primary areas of jurisdiction, that being employment, public accommodations, housing, discriminatory harassment, bias-based profiling by law enforcement, as well as retaliation. And I'll give folks just a brief minute to review our full list of protected classes here. Uh, I will not read them all one by one, but folks can take a look just to familiarize themselves with some of our protections here. All right. Um, so some of our goals I've already discussed um, briefly, but just recapping. Uh, we're going to be looking at how to be an upstander, looking at before, during, and after tactics and strategies, um, learning about concepts of oppression and power, identifying our own positionality, as well as potential barriers to intervening, as well as going over uh, issues responding to a variety of different incidents. And this is important because we're going to be looking, uh, we're going to be using a particular scope to look at um, uh, the issues today. But it's important to remember that the strategies and tools that we're going to be learning about today are applicable in any scenario, regardless of who the particular groups involved are. So we're gonna be uh, be starting today by just doing a brief grounding uh, through a breathing exercise. So I'll just ask everyone to adjust yourselves in a way that feels comfortable for you to do that. Um, whether that be sitting straight up in your chair, putting both feet on the ground. Um, if folks feel comfortable closing their eyes, they can do that as well. Whatever makes you feel most comfortable. So essentially what we're gonna be doing here uh, is just a brief breathing exercise to kind of calm, uh, bring a bit of calm and clarity to our virtual space here uh, as we get started. We know that you know a lot of the issues that we're gonna be talking about today are not just uh, intellectual or academic exercises, but are real issues that impact the community that maybe we ha ourselves have experienced or witnessed, or at least maybe have happened in our communities. So. We just wanna make sure we're entering the space with a sense of tranquility and calmness and, and clear headedness. So I'll invite everyone to just spend a few minutes uh, taking a deep inhale and pausing at the top of the breath and then letting out a nice long exhale, pausing at the bottom of the breath and then repeating. So I'll just give folks a few minutes to go ahead and do that. All right, and when folks are ready, uh, if your eyes are closed, I'll invite you to open them. Uh, you can feel free to readjust yourself again. Uh, just make yourself comfortable, bring your awareness back to the presentation, and we'll proceed to the next slide. All right, so in order to talk about bystander intervention, and why hate crimes and bias incidents occur, it's important to address the idea of oppression. So at the Commission on Human Rights, we define oppression as a pattern or system of inequality that gives power and privileges to members of one group of people at the expense of another. We have four different uh, manifestations of oppression here. Ideological, 
interpersonal, institutional, and internalized. So when we refer to ideological oppression, we're talking about the various isms and phobias. So racism, sexism, uh, homophobia, transphobia, um, you know, different ideologies that are either based in hate or ideas of hierarchy and inferiority and superiority of different groups. This is what we call ideological oppression. Interpersonal oppression refers to manifestations of oppression that occur in person-to-person uh, -person interactions. Interactions. So that can be the language that we use, that can be uh, trying to intimidate someone, that can be a physical attack, that can be name calling, microaggressions. All these different things are manifestations of interpersonal oppression. Institutional oppression uh, basically refers to all the various institutions in society that can participate in and perpetuate dynamics of oppression. So, you know, those institutions can be uh, government entities, government agencies. Um, hospitals, public schools can be institutions that um, partake in that, uh, elected officials, et cetera. Um, those can also be uh, private institutions. You can think of um, banks, private prisons, et cetera. Um, so various institutions can also participate in uh, enforcing and maintaining dynamics of oppression. And then finally, we have internalized oppression. So internalized oppression is this idea that uh, if a person or group are subjected to enough negative messages about themselves, about their group, although those notions are false and based in a hateful ideology, that individual or that group can begin to actually internalize those negative messages into a negative self-belief. Um, that's what we refer to as internalized oppression. And so this slide is just kind of recapping everything I've mentioned. So I'll just pass through this quickly in the interest of time. Um, so I, aha, uh -huh. so I apologize because I actually have a, a brief typo on this slide. Um, so the the text is referring to anti-Semitism. Uh, I did not change the title of uh, the slide from our previous slide, which was anti-Blackness to anti-Semitism. Uh, but the framework that I did want to use for today's presentation is anti-Semitism. Um, so especially in the context of, you know, current events that are happening right now, um, so one example of how we're going to look at this is through um, the lens that we just uh, were discussing previously. So some patterns and structures related to anti-Semitism can include uh, white supremacy, racism, xenophobia, uh, forms of overt discrimination can include uh, discrimination, denying the Holocaust, um, using particular slurs, uh, and as well as in the most explicit case, unfortunately, murders and hate crimes. Um, underlying false ideas uh, can include that Jewish people are less than, um, including harmful stereotypes, as well as uh, support of or ignorance of genocide and violence. Right, and then we also briefly like to touch on the uh, kind of redefining the idea of power. Uh, so traditionally, power is thought of as power over. So this is the kind of traditional hierarchical idea of domination as power. Um, uh, one group has it one group doesn't, and it's a limited finite resource. We also strive to redefine power uh, in a variety of different ways. So power with refers to the idea that power can be a shared resource that grows out of collaboration and relationships. Power to refers to the idea of being able to create new possibilities, create a new reality as out of our present circumstances. And power within is kind of the, um, the opposite of internalized oppression. It's um, when those negative ideas are not internalized, um, you know, having a sense of self-worth and self-knowledge. So these are alternative concepts of power that are kind of deviations from the traditional hierarchical domination-oriented definition of the idea. Okay, so um, one thing that we also uh, have to think about and is important to, um, you know, contemplate as well is we may see a bias incident occurring and want to intervene, but we may not be able to for a variety of reasons. We may choose not to. So it's important to think, you know, what are potential barriers to intervening? Well, typical things that we hear are the following. Um, fear for your own safety is a major one. So if there is a physical situation or a potential physical situation, one person, the person being targeted, you know, feels threatened and, and um, under pressure. If we involve the situation that we may be exposing ourselves as well to potential danger. So a fear for our own physical safety is definitely a top reason that we hear that folks hesitate to get involved. 
Uh, not knowing what to do, that's another important one as well. So we may want to intervene and feel like uh, we have the willingness to do so, but simply not know what to do. I mean, we didn't walk out of the door that morning expecting the situation to happen. This is not something that we necessarily had a game plan for, especially in an unpredictable situation with unknown actors. Uh, so not knowing what to do can definitely be a barrier as well. Uh, not wanting to make the situation worse is also an important one. So, you know, sometimes we hear from folks as well that, well, you know, the situation is bad, but it definitely can get worse. And maybe if I join the situation, you know, that can raise the tension. Uh, the person could feel more threatened, the aggressor become more aggressive. Um, so I don't want the situation to escalate, so I'm just not going to do anything. Um, maybe it's just words right now, and I don't want it to get physical, so I'm just going to walk away and, and hope that it just stays as a verbal altercation. That's another common thing that we hear as well. And finally, fear of exposure and that kind of referring to social exposure. So we're in the era of recording. Everyone, for the most part, has a smartphone with a, a video on it. So, you know, and we've all probably seen on social media or the news, right, someone uh, recording a fight that breaks out in the subway or, you know, some unfortunate incident like that. So if we get involved in a situation, we could potentially be that person in that viral video on social media and ending up on News 12. So these are all reasons that people may choose not to intervene in a situation. Um, but fortunately, you know, having taken all this into account, we have developed a variety of tactics and strategies that we can utilize so that when we get in a situation, we can um, work towards de-escalation, bearing in mind everyone's personal safety and having concrete, actionable items that we can employ in that situation to make sure that um, there is the most favorable outcome possible if we do choose to intervene. Okay, so we're gonna jump right in uh, with the before uh, um, tactics. So before you even approach the situation, what are the things to remember? So we have a series of acronyms we'll be using. Uh, I wouldn't really worry about remembering the acronyms per se, so much as just kind of internalizing these ideas. So number one is just to remember to breathe. Um, and that's important because just like we did uh, before we started the presentation today, just breathing, taking a few deep breaths can really go a long way in, in helping us um, approach the, the situation with a bit more uh, clarity and clear headedness. Um, you know, when we see a situation like that, especially if it's particularly uh, confrontational, someone's being aggressive, if, it's a, a, if there's been a physical altercation, um, you know, our blood is running, adrenaline can be high. And in a situation like that, it can be easy to um, have a misstep take place. So just by stopping for a few seconds and taking a few slow deep breaths, that can be enough to calm ourselves down and uh, create the sort of uh, mental space for allow us to uh, approach the situation in a more rational and calm way. Uh, being aware of your triggers is also extremely important. And this matters because you know, what's happening in the situation may feel very personal to us. Maybe the person being targeted is someone that looks like us. Maybe we've, uh, you know, seen this issue before. Maybe we experienced this situation before. So it's also important to remember, um, you know, what are the things that could potentially trigger me to act out? And by bearing that in mind, I can be prepared for that when I approach the situation so that if the aggressor says or does something that's particularly triggering to me, it'll be more likely that I can, uh, you know, keep calm and keep a cool head in the situation. Um, physically positioning yourself for safety, this is very important as well. So this just means uh, being aware of where your exits are, being aware of the people and places around you, whether they may be able to help you in the situation or whether they may pose another potential threat. Uh, this means keeping your hands available out of your pockets, conveying confident body language, keeping your head up, looking towards the person, um, and also being aware of eye contact. You know, bearing in mind, uh, is eye contact going to help the situation by, um, you know, allowing me to address the person more directly? Or if the person is being particularly, you know, belligerent and aggressive, could making eye contact with that person actually potentially lead to a confrontation? So using your best judgment with regard to that as well. Um, and then it's important to bear in mind social positionality. So what we mean by that is everyone occupies a particular social positionality in a situation such as this. So it's important to think about with regard to my identity and my appearance. Who am I in relation to the person who is the aggressor? Who am I in relation to the person who is being targeted? 
who am I in relation to other people that may be present in the space? And how is that going to affect how I approach the situation? For example, <clears throat> if the person who's the aggressor is somebody that maybe I share some type of identity with, I could potentially leverage that to establish a connection with that person and dissuade them or, or yeah, dissuade them from their behavior and help de-escalate the situation. Um, looking around the room, if I feel like the person being targeted is somebody who looks like me and everyone in the room is somebody who looks like the aggressor, um, I may judge that for me to intervene in that situation may, may pose a particular challenge for me and create a more threatening situation. And that may uh, help me make a determination about whether I want to intervene at all. And if I do, uh, what that intervention will look like. And so uh, we have a brief exercise here that I'll ask folks to, um, it says to, to do a writing exercise. I'll just ask folks to think about the exercise. If you have a pen, then it's, you know, it's great for you to do the writing as well. Um, but if you don't, that's fine. So I just ask folks to think, uh, you know, looking at this uh, um, uh, graph that we call the social identity wheel. So there's a variety of different uh, types of identities that we have listed here. What we ask folks to think about is, what are the top three identities that you see here that are most salient for you, that are most top of mind? What are the mo identities that you most identify with? And then to the contrary, which are the three that are least present in your mind? The elements of your identity that are least conscious for you. Um, so just taking a few minutes to think about that. Um, you know, Do we most identify with our national origin, with our ethnicity? with our socioeconomic class? Do we identify less with our gender, um, age, biological sex? You know, which part of our identities are more salient or less in our own mind? And we ask folks to think about this because it can, th this dynamic of our social positionality, again, it can affect whether or not we intervene in a situation at all. And if so, how we do that. And, you know, personally, I've heard folks say, oh yeah, like, um, you know, if I some if I see somebody that I identify with being targeted, I will be more likely to intervene, and that definitely is a, a natural um, uh, human reaction, I would say. However, we also challenge folks to think about whether they would intervene, even if the person being targeted or anybody in the situation was not somebody that necessarily reflected themselves or their group, because of course, um, you know, hate is hate. And discrimination is discrimination, regardless of who is the target and who is the perpetrator. So it's just important um, to think about, you know, when we witness a bias center intervention, uh, um, or whether when we witness a, a bias incident, where our willingness to intervene or not intervene is coming from, and really challenging ourselves to always consider intervening and try our best to do that, regardless of who is the aggressor and who is the perpetrator. <clears throat> or I should say, who is the perpetrator and who is being targeted. Okay, so moving away from the uh, pre-intervention, we're also going to now move into the actual intervention itself. So we have what we call the four Ds of active bystander intervention. Uh, and this is uh, direct, delegate, distract, and we'll see one more on the next slide. So direct, basically, the word says it all. This is the most direct, confrontational uh, way to go about it. So this is walking right up to the aggressor. This is verbally addressing them. This is, if there's a physical altercation happening, breaking it up, getting in between you know, the two people or whatever the case may be. When we're doing a direct intervention, we're naming the person, we're naming the issue, and we're addressing it as directly as we can. Uh, this can still, of course, be done in a diplomatic way. Um, but it is direct. Now, next we have delegate. So delegate basically means that myself as the person initiating the intervention, I don't have to do it alone, right? I don't have to bear the sole responsibility for this intervention and have all the attention of the aggressor be on me. If there's other people around that I can mobilize, I'm going to do that. So if I'm on the subway, are other passengers willing to intervene? Um, if I'm in a workplace, are other colleagues willing to intervene? If I'm on a bus, uh, is the bus driver willing to do something? Uh, can I call law enforcement or security guard, whoever? Um, these are all examples of delegating so that myself as a person intervening, 
I don't have to go it alone. I can say, hey, let's do this together. Uh, and that can be effective for a variety of reasons. Uh, distract. So this is a really interesting way to intervene. This basically is a way of disrupting the situation without even to necessarily even directly address it. Um, and one perfect example of creating a distraction that I always use, um, which is a real life example from a former colleague of mine, is that uh, so he witnessed a man standing above a woman who was seated on the subway uh, very aggressively hitting on her and she was clearly not interested and very uncomfortable. So what he did was approach uh, the gentleman and ask him for directions to Coney Island. So they were on an uptown train on, you know, whatever line it was. And he said, I'm trying to, I'm a tourist visit in New York. I'm trying to get to, to Coney Island. Can you help me? And he engaged in this whole conversation with this guy about what train to take, where to transfer, how many transfers, what is there to do on Coney Island? What else should I do in New York? Right. So he created this whole distraction, which he never even mentioned the situation with the woman, but it still created the opportunity for a woman to exit the situation. So that's an example of distraction. <clears throat> uh, and then we have documentation. So in the event that you did not feel comfortable doing any type of intervention that would actually interrupt the situation, but you wanted to do something from a distance, documenting is a valid option. So we've definitely seen instances in which if there was not documentation of a particular incident that occurred, there might not have been any accountability, but because there was documentation, there was accountability for the aggressor. So documentation can be very important. Uh, and then checking in with the person who was affected afterwards as well. Um, if you have the opportunity to do so, hey, are you okay? Uh, would you like me to call 911? Do you need medical assistance? Um, can I connect you with any resources? And also just affirming that the aggressor does not represent the views of the community, that that is one person, and that everyone else does not feel that way, and they, they do want them to be there as part of the community and are looking out for them. Um, just checking the Q&A quickly. Yes. Um, yeah, definitely uh, validating the questions and comments. I'm going to table addressing them specifically until a bit later in the presentation. I'm going to get through the rest of the comment, but the content, but I do appreciate the question and comment. Um, <clears throat> so continue on. Um, so, OK, we have some specific de-escalation strategies that we're going to take a look at here as well. Um, so again, we have this acronym, GAMBLIN. Don't worry about remembering the acronym. Just internalizing the ideas is the most important. So um, so get to we. Uh, this is a, an important one with regard to language. So we have a few options. We can use you language or we language. Now, you language can escalate the situation. You're racist. You're bad. You need to stop. You this, you that. Although it might be true what we're saying, using that type of targeting you language towards the aggressor can make them more defensive and more aggressive. Whereas if we use we language, that can de-escalate the situation. You know, do we need to act like that? What else can we do? I think it would be better if we do X, Y, Z. You know, how are we feeling about this, et cetera? So using we language, trying to bring, call, call the aggressor in rather than calling them out, um, that can be effective for de-escalation. Um, is intervention recommended when a weapon is involved? So uh, I'm just going to briefly respond to this by saying every situation is different. Um, we never say definitely do or definitely don't intervene. That's up to the judgment of the individual. The most important thing to keep in mind is um, just the safety, the safety of everyone involved, right? Given the nature of the situation, is my intervention going to be more likely to escalate the situation and revolt, result in physical harm or de-escalation and safety? Um, so that's that's the question we should ask ourselves. But we can never say definitively you should or should not engage in a particular situation. Every situation is different. Every person is different. Uh, so continuing here, uh, offering alternatives. Um, 
So this is basically the idea that, you know, the person is demonstrating some type of problematic behavior. What is an alternative to that behavior? If they've used problematic language, what is alternative language that they can use? If they're conducting themselves in an inappropriate way, what's a more appropriate way that they can do that? So again, rather than say, hey, you're doing this wrong, we can actively promote the alternative behavior and try to nudge the person in that direction. Uh, match and lead to step it down. This is based on the idea that um, people mirror each other's behavior. So some folks may feel that if someone is being belligerent, that we can shout them down. We can be the, the louder, the more aggressive person, shout them down, shut them up. Uh, but in reality, that is actually more likely to escalate the situation. If they're here and we're here, they're more likely to go here. So imagine Lee step it down means that if they're here, we match them here to get their attention. And then we come down and they're actually more likely to follow us down. So match to get the attention, lead down to de-escalate. Broken record is the idea that um, if we don't know what to say or do, we don't have to come up with a lengthy plan of attack or explanation to give to this person. We can just choose one simple statement and repeat it over and over again. So for example, if someone's using offensive language, we can say that language is that language is offensive. And we can repeat that a hundred times if we want to. That language is offensive. Hey, that language is offensive, right? Until the person gets the point. And that could be sufficient. That, that, that could work. Uh, lose to win, that basically means choosing your battles. So, you know, in an ideal situation, we would want there to be accountability and justice uh, for the person who was the aggressor. However, um, sometimes just exiting the situation can be the, the best thing to ensure the safety of the person being targeted and everyone involved. So for example, if the person is on the train, just getting them off the train. If the person is in a store, just getting them out of the store. If it's happening in the street, maybe getting them into a store, right? Into a bodega or some type of safe place off the street. So um, losing to win, that just means, you know, yeah, knowing when to choose your battles and just uh, help the person exit the situation. I statements, uh, that's similar to get to we, it's an alternative to you language. So instead of saying you, we can say we, and instead of saying you, we can also say I, right? So I find that language offensive. This is making me uncomfortable. I feel X, Y, Z. I think X, Y, Z. So coming up with a statement that we can make on speaking for ourselves rather than targeting the person, that can also help get our point across in a way that makes the person less defensive and helps to de-escalate. And then finally, Naming the behavior. Um, so naming the behavior, what this essentially means is that, again, rather than tell the person that there's something wrong with them, we tell the person that there's something wrong with what they are doing. And that gives them the opportunity to change the behavior, change the language, or whatever the issue is, switch to that alternative. <clears throat> and just a couple additional notes here. Uh, it's it's important to think about how we're approaching the situation. Uh, we do not want to approach the aggressor from directly behind because that can feel very threatening, like they're about to get jumped. Uh, if we also approach very directly uh, in the front, that can also feel like we're kind of looking for a fight, puffing our chest out. So the, the, what we prefer for folks to do is to kind of approach from the side, maybe a little in front and to the side to let them know like, hey, I'm here. I'm not sneaking up on you but I'm also not looking for a fight. Um, and it's also important to keep in mind that no one of these strategies is better than the other. This is not a hierarchy of effectiveness. Um, every, every strategy is just as valid as the other. And if one is not working, we can switch it up and choose another one. Okay, so now we have some scenarios. Uh, so I will read these and ask folks to put their responses in the chat. So, or the q and I should say. Uh, so scenario one is, an old low-income queer man wearing a Jewish star necklace is walking on the street and someone stops him and asks if he is Jewish. To that, the man replies, yes, what if I am? The person on the street starts to yell homophobic and anti-Semitic slurs behind the man and tries to intimidate him by chasing him down the street. The man is scared since he, as of now, has no safe place to go. How can you intervene in this situation and what different types of support and resources could you offer? So any responses that you have here, just bearing in mind the different tools that we've looked at so far in the presentation, how would you respond to this situation? You can go ahead and put your comments in the Q&A.
And Ryan, while people are doing that, I just wanted to um, make you aware of the time. Uh, it's 1247. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, we will we will definitely have everybody out of here by one o'clock. So don't worry about that. Ryan, while I don't see anything in the Q&A uh, to your direct question, there is a question in Q&A if you want to address it. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, you know what? Uh, if folks would rather just do a standard Q&A rather than go this, through the scenarios, that's fine too. Um, I will take a look through the Q&A and address these. Um, and then in the few minutes left, if folks want to do the scenarios, you know, we, we can definitely run through them. If not, we can just stick with the Q&A. Uh, I see a, a hand raised. Lisa Davis has a hand raised. Yes, Lisa. Yes. Um, I was just wondering if we could do maybe one of the, the first scenario that you presented, and then uh, you can go to the questions. Does that sound all right with everyone? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm fine with that. It's just that um, I'm not seeing any responses in the Q&A. Um, so that's the only issue. I mean, unless folks just would like to take a moment to think about it before they respond. Also, if somebody would like to respond by using the raise hand function, I'll be able to unmute you. But yeah, that would be great as well. And we do have a raised hand. Hi. Um, yes. So um, what I would do, which it actually happens, um, what I did was that the person who was being yelled at and stuff, like I approached him from the side and I acted like I was their friend. Mm -hmm. And I said, hey, how are you? Whatever. And if I see a store nearby or whatever, I said, hey, um, oh, how are you? Thank you for meeting me. Yeah, look, the store is right here. And we just walked to the store together. And then that other person just disappeared. So that's just one of the scenarios. Oh, that's yes. what, what happened at the moment with me. Yes, and I love that scenario because that is something uh, that's a that's a same strategy that I've actually heard from quite a few people have used pretending they know the person um, to just kind of, you know, be with them and, and let the aggressor know that that person is not alone and maybe help them exit the situation. Um, that's a really great way, which I in the context of our tools, I would probably uh, classify that as creating a distraction. Um, it's also kind of a direct intervention. Um, but yeah, I think that that's a really great tactic and I, and I know that it has worked for other people as well. I'm um, just seeing in the chat as well. Uh, someone said possibly yell out from a distance, leave him alone, continue to monitor the situation and seek out law enforcement. Yeah, I think that that's a great idea as well. So, uh, the, the, the verbal, uh, intervention, if we didn't feel comfortable doing, you know, inserting ourselves physically into the station, the situation, uh, delegating to law enforcement, definitely a great idea as well. All right, so let's take a look at one more scenario, and then I'll go ahead and address the questions in the Q&A. So in our scenario we have here, uh, oh, we have one more comment in the Q&A. I just want to check here. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm going to uh, just once more uh, go through the scenario, and then right after that, I'll jump into the the other questions in the Q and A. So, um, scenario two: uh, two Muslim women wearing hijab are standing on the train platform waiting to board their train. A group of guys walk up to them and begin harassing them. You're standing on the platform witnessing the assault. One of them is trying to pull off their hijabs while shouting, "Go back to where you came from." What would you do in this situation? So again, if folks want to raise their hand, um, and they can be unmuted, I think that's the best way.
Any thoughts on how you would intervene in this situation? Now we have a hand raised, Gordon. Gordon, you're able to unmute. Hey, Gordon, who raised your hand, you should be able to unmute yourself and speak. Uh, maybe, maybe there's a tech issue. That uh, hand is up again. Unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, got you. Okay, what I would do in that situation is I would pretend that I was laughing, but I would record the incident. Mm. Okay, yeah, so absolutely documentation. That could definitely be an, a, a valid option as well, absolutely. Uh, Trisha has a hand up as well. Hi, I figured I'd, I'd jump in here too. I. I think, I mean, this one's really scary. I mean, all of them are very scary to me. And I would just say, you know, that in this situation where uh, somebody is, is putting their hands on somebody else, I, I guess in my, I would like to think that I would try to get in between and try to like create some physical space between these two. I think that, I mean, on the platform, you're, I would be nervous about trains, about people, about uh, limited space. Um, I think I'd be calling out for, for, help um and looking to see if there's any way to create more physical space between the two between uh these two well you know for protecting protecting these two women in particular yeah absolutely so i, I mean, yeah it, it's it's definitely a particularly challenging situation uh in in light of the fact that a physical altercation is taking place but i think yeah definitely the um the actions that you put forth are definitely valid ones as well so thank you for that as well I'm um, just checking the Q&A, one additional here. Okay, yeah, somebody saying that they just don't feel comfortable responding because of the material is so new. Absolutely, that's completely fine. Uh, I mean, we know that, uh, yeah, a lot of these uh, tools are very new to folks. And also, you know, it's difficult to put ourselves in, in, in the shoes of someone actually in that situation. It, it, it's easy to say what we would do in a PowerPoint presentation, right? But then when the nerves of the real situation are affecting us, that can be a game changer as well. So I definitely understand that position as well. Um, okay, so with that said, um, I'm going to do is just skip ahead to our contact information page, just so that'll be up in our last few minutes. Um, because I do want to get to the Q&A as well. Our last few slides are just kind of uh, wrapping up and saying, um, you know, it's important to just have um, having grace with yourself and understanding that, you know, these are really challenging situations. Um, so, you know, whether you intervene or don't, no matter how the intervention goes, just know that, you know, you did your best and that's the most important thing. And also as somebody who's intervening, you may also want to engage in, you know, self-care, some type of aftercare for yourself after the incident as well, because not only for the person being targeted, but also you as the upstander, it can be a very challenging situation that can affect you as well. Uh, so all the commission's contact information is up here for you. Uh, in the meantime, I will um, slide to the Q&A very quickly, just so I can address whatever pending questions were in there. Uh, so are there protections or agencies an upstander can contact if they end up becoming the target of the harassment when choosing to intervene? So I would say it's the commission. It, or, it's either the commission or the police department. So if you have, if you feel that you've been, you suffered, you've been the attack of a criminal act. If so, you someone has physically attacked you. I mean, that's an issue for law enforcement for sure. If what you feel as has you've experienced is maybe not to the point of criminal enforcement, but that you were a victim of discrimination in this case, under the law of the, uh, the human rights law of New York city, this would be discriminatory harassment. You can report that to the commission on human rights and we can look into it as well. Try to identify, you know, who the aggressor is and, and what justice looks like in that situation. Again, we're a law enforcement agency, um, enforcing the civil rights law. So that that would likely be uh, considered a violation of our law as well. <laughs> um, so just talking about being inclusive of the um, various isms and phobias. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, our 
presentation, especially today, you know, having less than an hour, uh, it's impossible to cover everything adequately in an ideal world, right? Every presentation that we do would be able to cover all different types of manifestations of all different types of uh, discrimination and bias incidents. But because we generally have quite a limited amount of time, which is usually an hour or less to do the presentation, we generally pick one particular framework um, and, and drive in on that. Again, today, uh, the framework that I chose to use was anti-Semitism. Um, I, I apologize uh, again for, for not switching the title of the particular slide. Um, but the most important thing to remember is always that these tools are universally applicable. Whether the nature of the hate crime is uh, sexism, transphobia, racism, anti-Semitism, xenophobia, these tools and strategies are universal and you can apply them in any given scenario. So that's just the one thing I'll say on that as well. Um, if there's a weapon involved, I've already answered that. Um, police officers, de-escalating situation, are they required to take this training and use it? Uh, so to, to the extent of my knowledge, police officers are not required to take this training. If you know anyone in the NYPD that is interested in booking us for this training, please let me know. I will be happy to deliver it. Um, but as far as I know, law enforcement is not uh, required to take the training. Um, but we're, we're, we're happy to deliver the training to anyone, whether that be law enforcement, city agencies, members of the public, et cetera. We, we, we uh, do this for everyone. So, uh, yeah. Any referrals that you have, please pass them my way. Um, taking a look at the time, I know we have just about one minute left. Um, okay, so intervention when police officers are involved. Um, so again, the best I can say is to, to use your best judgment. Um, I would never dissuade someone from intervening when they feel that that is important and necessary. But again, what I would say is that um, our own, you know, physical and personal integrity matters. So, you know, some folks have proposed using documentation, right, rather than a direct intervention. That might be a way to, to stage an intervention that also bears in mind, you know, your own uh, safety and self-preservation. Um Eric, I see you coming on camera, and I know it's one o'clock, so I'm I'm wondering if that means that we're we're off. I, I appreciate you taking that final question. And yeah, um, just wanted to take a moment just to thank you again for being here, for presenting. Um, always a pleasure to have you. Um, and we hope that everyone was able to get um, something out of this. I, I did, and I'm sure everyone else did too. Um, as Ryan has mentioned, if you do have any questions, if there's any concerns, or you need to speak to somebody from the Commission on Human Rights, please um, take a look, not, uh, take note of the info that's on the screen right now. There's a phone number, there's the website, and there's an email address as well. Um, with that, I know we're going to be wrapping up now. Just one last time, um, putting in the chat for everyone, please, if you are interested in joining us for our Friday training, the emergency preparedness training, um, where you'll be able to get an emergency preparedness kit, um, that information and the link to subscribe for um, that in-person training noon on Friday at John Jay um, is in the chat as is um, Ryan's email. So you'll be able to reach out to him directly. Just wanna thank you all for being here again. Appreciate you. Um, hopefully see many of you at our 5.30 training this evening. So with that, just thanks again. And I hope everyone has a good afternoon. Man, take care everyone. Thank you for your attendance. Take care. Thank you, Ryan.